Welcome to Tune In Tuesday, The One Lord of Original Christianity, Chapter 2, Session 12, The Home Stretch. We're finishing our thorough analysis of the similarities and dissimilarities between God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. This Chapter 2 has been very revealing. We can argue with our fellow Christians, brothers, through seven sunrises until the horses come back into the barn or till hell freezes over about who God and Jesus are not. And they may never be convinced, but if we concentrate upon who God is and who Jesus really is, the preponderance of evidence will make itself manifest. And by this approach... It can be clearly seen what was original and then what was imposed upon it later. God poured out many of his own traits into his son when he raised him from among the dead and glorified him. And when he raised him further into heaven and he sat down at God's right hand. So we are on the home stretch in this last category of the attributes of the play Roma that Jesus received. Jehovah is God in his relationship to the creation, and he shared many divine Godhead attributes with his Son, but not all. So, hasn't this been illuminating? I'm thankful to God for Rene Fretz, who took my initial foray into Colossians 2.9 and expanded it, and then he and I pursued it to this end. There are many other causes and concepts which... I may have stimulated in you that can be pursued in the same way. So, what has God kindled in your heart? I say, go for it. The heaven's the limit. Limit? (laughs) Uh, Heaven's infinite. Like I said last week, God has immeasurable, indescribable, inconceivable plans for us. We're going to be with him for eternity. So, why not get started now? (laughs) Each of us has a custom, installed Holy Spirit and a unique holy calling. Have you found yours yet? If so, go for it with all the gusto you got and God will pour it on. The world really needs us now doing just that. If you don't know what it is yet, well, keep looking, keep acting, and God will illuminate your door and open it. It doesn't matter how much of our lives have passed, And how much is left, God is God and can do what God does. So just keep seeking, asking, and knocking until you knock the doors down. Our goal is glory. And that glory is inevitable. We just have a few attributes left in this category of God's monarchy and lordship. How Jehovah, Yahweh, deals with his creation in his relationship with us. And we're at the bottom of the third column in the chart. But before we finish up the chart, I want to pursue a few more aspects of fatherliness that we covered last week. God is our father. Jesus is not. He is God's son. But although he did not display fatherliness, Jesus did excel at (laughs) Sonness. <laughs> I showed you that with that summary of the Gospel of John, how that its literally expressed purpose was. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Record after record after record were written for that purpose. That's why those incidents appear in the Gospel of John and, and not the other Gospels. Chapter after chapter, documenting Son of God, Son of God, right? That's a preponderance of evidence. The other people's supposed idea that the Gospel of John declares him as God is tenuous at best and can be cleared up by showing the poor interpretations of a few verses that they point to. There's only a few of them in there, and there's far more that prove that he is God's Son. So, in the one God of original Christianity I showed that the common translation of Exodus 3.14, I am that I am, was contaminated by Greek influence and is it's wrong. Therefore, there's absolutely no correlation between it and the several 
quote unquote I am verses in the Gospel of John. Jesus did not say I am ego ami anywhere. Jesus did not speak Greek. He did not say ego ami. Huh. He spoke Aramaic. So he couldn't have said it. So there's no correlation besides the Old Testament translation is improper. So Aramaic, like Hebrew and many other ancient Semitic languages, does not have a copular verb. Now, modern Hebrew does because of its, it was affected during the 17th and 18th century during the Zionist movement when the Hebrew language was recovered. It was only spoken by scholars. It wasn't a common spoken language. And then it became to be a common spoken language. And it was promoted by people who were European, who thought in European languages and spoke other European languages. And it influenced modern Hebrew. One of the influences was the use of the copular verb, a linking verb, like we have in English. So in ancient Hebrew, they didn't have I am that I am. It was incorrect. It would be I will become what I will become. We covered that, and it's in Rotherham's introduction to his Bible. So since there is no correlation between that I am and the I am's that are in the Gospel of John, that kicks one of the major claims in the teeth right there. Also, I've covered John 1.1 in other sessions. So the next verse that is tried to be used to prove the Trinity is John 1.18. So look, take a look at John 1.18. It says, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Now, there are a few critical Greek texts assembled by scholars that instead of, quote, only begotten Son, unquote, they read, quote, only begotten God, unquote. Well, what is that? The terms begotten and God are mutually exclusive. They, they can't stand together. Now, from a textual criticism standpoint, both readings do have early attestation. Now, we're, we're very fortunate to have deeper insight into the thoughts of the scholars who published one of those critical texts that was in the Nestle Olland text tradition. Now, I am not related to Irwin and Eberhard Nestle, N-E-S-T-L-E. They were originally from Germany. My family, named Nestle, comes from the Netherlands. It was originally Nestlerot. Now, I cover the critical texts in more detail in a session in my Work in a Word class, but because many of us have Barry's Interlinear by George Ricker Barry, we're familiar with the GLTTRAW texts that are mentioned in the apparatus at the bottom. That's Griesbach, Lachman, Tischendorf, Tregellis, Alford, and Wordsworth. Those were critical texts which were published after Stephen's text. There's also a Beza and an Elsevier in that sequence as well. But these were the critical texts that were published after Stephen's, and they were included in Barry's interlinear up to the point where it was published. There have been other critical texts after that. But, by the way, the critical texts by Griesbach, Lachman, Tischendorf, Tregellis, Alford, and Wordsworth are all available for free PDF download on archive.org. The copyrights have expired, and so they're public domain. Even Tischendorf's 8th edition, which is very hard to find in book form, the next critical text after Barry's Interlinear was published and Alford and Wordsworth was Westcott and Hort's text. That's the one that was used to translate the 1881 English Revised Bible and later its counterpart, the 1901 American Standard. After Westcott and Hort came Weymouth, Weiss, W-E-I-S-S, then 
Eberhard Nessel and his son Erwin. And also there was someone named Von Soden. He published a critical text, but he used an entirely different methodology and nomenclature. And it deviated from the accepted standards so much that people have not used his work much. After Irwin came Kurt Alland, A-L-A-N-D, and he was of the Institute for Neuen Testamentlich Textforschung, that's uh, the New Testament Textual Research in Munster, Germany. After Kurt Alland, the project was assumed by his wife Barbara, and currently it's headed by Dr. Holger Strutwolf. They currently are amassing a database concerning every manuscript known, and are working on a project utilizing an analysis method called the coherence-based genealogical method, which ultimately will produce a complete critical text that they are calling the Edito Critica Mayor. There have been a string of critical texts in book form that were published from this institute, the 25th edition of the Nessel Allen text was edited by Erwin Nessel and Kurt Allen. I heard someplace that he wanted his pronunciation of his name to be Nestle. I haven't been able to confirm that. But anyway, Erwin and Kurt Allen, uh, the first edition of this 25th edition was published in 1963. And it's had several editions since the one I own is published in 1975. After that, in 1966, the United Bible Societies published a variation which was edited by a committee of scholars, Kurt Olland, Matthew Black, Bruce Metzger, and Alan Wittgren. This has been republished and enhanced several times since, and different scholars have joined and left. I have the 1966 edition of that. This text is essentially the same as the Nessel Olland 25th edition. However, in the apparatus at the bottom, it lists fewer variant readings. Only the ones that they deemed were quote-unquote important are shown. But there's more textual variants listed for each variation than are found in the 25th edition of the Nessel Allen text. So the Nessel Allen text shows more variant readings with less attestation. That's the difference between the two. Then the 26th edition of the Nessel Allen text added Carlo Martini to the fore, and that was published in 1979. And then as new finds have been discovered and collated, Collating is where they compare a manuscript with another manuscript and note the differences. So, collated and entered into database form. Uh, new editions have been published and different scholars have joined and or left the team. And they're now all the way up to the 28th edition, which is beginning to incorporate portions of the Edito Critica Mayor. Now, the reason I'm giving you this detail is that we have a fascinating insight into the thoughts of the scholars for John 118. Because one of the scholars, Bruce Metzger, published a textual commentary on the Greek New Testament, which is a companion volume to the third edition of the United Bible Society's text. I have a copy of it. And it summarizes the discussion that went on between the scholars as they considered each textual variation. Now, you know what I mean by textual variation. The the Bible is the greatest attested ancient document. There are only a few copies of the Iliad and the Odyssey or some of the other famous works by Plato and Aristotle, etc. And the period of time between when they were first written and the copy that we now have in a museum someplace is hundreds and hundreds of years. However, with the Bible, there are more fragments, more manuscripts of it than any other document. Now, what I mean by manuscript, 
That is a handwritten document, manuscripto, handwritten. And all of these different manuscripts were written up to the time in 1450 and 1550, during that period of time when printing was invented. The first document, first book that was printed was the Gutenberg Bible. And after printing came out, then all of the different errors that had been creeping into the word over time ceased, were frozen, so to speak, by the printed versions. And so there were, I think there's 25,000 different manuscripts, handwritten documents of the Bible that exist. These uh, range in date from around 150 to 200 A.D. for the earliest, earliest one, which is a little part of John 6, where it's like one page, where all the perimeter of the page was eaten away and all that's left is just the center two inches or so. That's the oldest one, I think. And they range from something like that to entire Bibles. There's some famous codices, they call them, Codex is a book form where it's bound, has a spine with the pages open up. It's not a scroll. It's a codex. It's like a book. And there are some entire Bibles that exist in book form. And then there's a lot of pages in between. I'm familiar with the work of Dr. Arthur Vubis, who was a famous Aramaic scholar. And back in the 50s and 60s, when you could travel in Iran and Iraq freely. Uh, now with all the political stuff going on there, this is totally, totally impossible. But what Dr. Vubis would do is he'd travel, he'd go to a Christian site and befriend the, the librarian there. And sometimes it would take years and several visits to gain trust. And then finally... They would allow him to look at their precious documents, which were like relics for that church or for that, or that monastery. And so he would tell them how to preserve them. He would take pictures of them. And Dr. Arthur Vubis amassed the largest amount of Aramaic documents in the world. And then he passed that on to the Lutheran Theological Seminary that was right near the University of Chicago. And so he would travel and he would he would look for these different fragments. I know another person who took a trip to Egypt. He went out to a monastery that was in the middle of nowhere and he did the same thing. He talked with the curator of the library there, asked them if they had any ancient old manuscripts and the guy brought out one page and it was very very early so this person helped them preserve it with what they had so he took two pieces of glass put it in between and took masking tape (laughs) and taped the edges so it'll be sealed took pictures of it and it turned out to be a missing page from a document that is in a museum in Great Britain. So you can't do that anymore over there now with all the craziness going on. But there's, there were manuscripts all over the world that were assembled. People started traveling in the 1700s and 1800s to look for them. Some of the manuscripts were actually reused where they'd scrape off the ink and turn it sideways and write on it again. And so uh, there was some famous manuscripts that the Bible was the what was scraped off and so somebody took the time to try to read that <laughs> amazing so of all these different fragments there's 25,000 manuscripts that exist roughly and in those 25,000 manuscripts there are 150,000 variations most of the variations are inconsequential word order spelling about well, 99% of them are inconsequential in meaning or, or import. But the last 1%, 1,500 of them, really make a difference. And so textual scholars, what they do is they analyze these different manuscripts. They look for 
traits to try to figure out which manuscripts were earlier than other ones. And so they utilize a process called textual criticism, where they use points of logic to try to deduce what the original read. So, back to what I was talking about with the textual commentary. Bruce Metzger and Alan Wickren and Matthew Black and Kurt Olland got together in this room and they went through the New Testament and they discussed all of the different variations. And so they discussed and they would vote and the majority then would carry what they would put in the UBS text. But if a dissenter had a strong opinion, Metzger would include it in his book. He would include all the discussion and they had a um, set of indications of what they thought was for sure. They had an A in braces for very certain. Then they had a capital B in braces for like a eh, could be. <laughs> and then they had a C in braces for maybe. And a D in braces for doubtful. So, what did the committee say about John 118? Some manuscripts say only begotten son. Other manuscripts say only begotten God. Okay? Very interesting. So, <laughs> Ren Minetti wrote me a comment, and, I, and actually I'm going to get to that. It's very interesting, Ren, bless you. But anyway, um, so the committee voted, and they liked Only Begotten God better than Only Begotten Son. And the reason that they thought so was because of two early papyrus manuscripts named P66 and P75. They were early, supposedly. But one of the four dissented, Mr. Wickren. And he dissented, and he was in favor of only begotten son. So that's why they didn't give it an A, they gave it a B. And Wickren had the same opinion that Red Minetti just wrote me about, because he said that the difference between only begotten God and only begotten Son probably arose from a mistranscription of the abbreviation for the word Son. Remember, they had they abbreviated things to make them more important back then. It was called the Nomina Sacra, the holy names. And so they would abbreviate Spirit and Son and Christ and Jesus and God with two-letter abbreviations. And the abbreviation for Son is Upsilon Sigma, a U-S. And then they put a line over the top. We put a dot after it for abbreviations. They would put a line over the top to indicate abbreviation. So Wickren said that the reading only begotten God should be a D. It should be doubtful instead of a B, instead of a eh, could be. Okay? Now, in my opinion, I like only begotten son. I say that that reading should prevail for a couple of reasons. First of all, the early manuscripts occurrences are compelling, but also lately there's been some doubt cast on the early dates originally put forth for P66 and P75. This has been put forth by a new analysis of the dating of the orthography, the how the uh, letters were written and the styles and that kind of thing. And so, if that's true, it puts the variants, only begotten Son and only begotten God, on a more equal footing. They could go either way. But also, one of the other principles of textual criticism is they like to take the oldest, say that's most likely to be original. Not always is that the case, but also there are different families of manuscripts that are based upon certain traits that they have in common. So they have an Alexandrian family, they have a Western family, they have a Caesarean family, and then they have a Byzantine family. Those are the four major families. And if a reading only occurs in one family, 
then it's less likely. But if a reading is more widespread and occurs in all of the families, then it's more likely. All right. And also another thing is that they took early versions of the Bible and translated them into many languages. That is, at least until 600 A.D., when all the other languages except the Latin Vulgate became illegal. But many of the early versions in other languages, like the Old Aramaic, the Armenian, the Ethiopic, the Georgian, and even the Vulgate, and I thought that was funny, the Latin Vulgate says, Unigenitus Filius, Only Begotten Son. So, because it's in the all these widespread versions, I think that I'm I'm going towards Only Begotten Son. Of course, my critics are going to say, well, you're just bowing to your theology. Well, I could say the same about them. Either variant has good footing. So, how are we going to decide? Well, <laughs> the word has to fit. <laughs> I mean, it was really God-breathed, then the word has to fit. See, you have to understand, in most cases, the textual scholars were trying to deduce what reading rose from the other, independent, of whether they really fit theologically. In fact, Lachman, the L in Nurberry's Interlinear, he was not a, a Bible scholar, he was a classical Greek scholar. And so he was, he was just utilizing the principles of textual criticism independent of the theology. Now, of course, the modern method that's being used by the Institute in Munster, the coherence-based genealogical method, it's just a refinement of that. I talk more about all of this in the transmission of the text session of my work in the word class that's available on way beyond. Now, most of the textual scholars analysis was based on external evidence, like what region around the Mediterranean it came from, its textual family, or the estimated date that the manuscript was written. Of course, they didn't put the dates on there. (laughs) They didn't say copyright 1966, like we can see on the my UBS text. No. So they have to estimate when it was written. And so, for example, it was written on paper versus papyrus. Paper was not used until later. See? Papyrus was used earlier. Also, there's other traits, like, was it an uncial or a cursive? Uncial is all caps. That occurred earlier. Or, were there spaces in between the words, or were there they're not spaces? If there were not spaces, that's earlier. And there's other features. For example, they didn't have chapter markings, but they had other kinds of markings. And the more of those markings, the later it is. So there's a number of different traits that are used to estimate the age. That's all external evidence. But then there's something called internal evidence. And that is, the word has to fit. It has to make sense. Now, Alford, the A, in Barry's interlinear, he was one that argued for that. Internal evidence. The word has to fit. We all know that scribes corrected what they thought was wrong in the Bible when they were copying it. One of the things they did is the the monks harmonized the New Testament quotations of the Old Testament with the Septuagint because they were copying a Greek text for the New Testament and there is a Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint. And so they tried to harmonize the quotations of the Old Testament with the Septuagint instead of just saying what the Word said. Because Jesus didn't speak Greek when he quoted the Old Testament in the Gospels. So he could never have said it the way the Septuagint says it, because sometimes the Septuagint gets pretty liberal in how it translates stuff. He would have quoted straight from the Hebrew. But what these scribes did is they they disregarded that, and they, tra- they harmonized the Septuagint 
with the New Testament quotes, or the other way around. They, they harmonize the New Testament quotes with the Septuagint. All right? They also inserted many theological additions intentionally. Now, of course, there were unintentional errors. Sometimes they would have what's called a scriptorum, and they would have someone reading from a text and several copyists simultaneously writing. So that was a mass production method (laughs) of making Bible texts. So if you misheard or whatever, or misspelt because you didn't know how to spell it, that would be an error of that type. Then sometimes, if you had a copyist who was doing it by himself, and you were going along the line, and that line ended in three or four letters, and the next line ended in the same three or four letters, like a suffix in Greek, which are more common, Sometimes your eye would skip down and you'd see the second line when you went back to look at it to copy. And so, because both lines ended the same way, they'd skip the line. They thought they would already have done that line. They'd skip a line and they'd leave it out. So that's how a whole line could be unintentionally left out because it ended the same. All right? Also, sometimes they would proofread their text and they'd make errors like everyone makes errors when you copy stuff and so they would write in the correction in between the lines or they put it in the margin but also monks had their own copy their own private bible that they used for study and sometimes they put a comment in the margin well a hundred years later when some monk is m- making a new manuscript and he goes to the library to find an exemplar to use for it he might have grabbed this other monk's book that had the note in it well now is that a correction or is that a note so sometimes stuff would be included by mistake unintentionally that way but there also were many intentional things and usually to substantiate doctrine For example, Griesbach has a couple infamous quotes. He says, The New Testament abounds in more glosses, editions, and interpolations purposely introduced than any other book. And worse, here this is the one they hate the most. This quote of, of Griesbach. He said, quote, The most suspicious reading of all is the one that yields a sense favorable to the nourishment of piety especially monastic piety, when there are many variant readings in one place, that reading which more than the others manifestly favors the dogmas of the Orthodox is deservedly regarded as suspicious, unquote. <laughs> they, they hate that one. But there were absolutely forgers of the truth. They changed it. Now, who would do such a thing? Change the Bible. I mean, but you know what? Do you want to see how blatant they were? Take a look at Revelation chapter 22. Please take a look at Revelation chapter 22. All right? In verse 19 is a stark example of an intentional change. So, Revelation 22, 18, we'll we'll get a running start. It says, For I testify to everyone that hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Ooh! Verse 19, And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. Ah! Well... That's pretty severe, isn't it? But wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Somebody changed a word in that verse. They changed a word in that that verse. (laughs) That's like signing your own death warrant. (laughs) I mean, you'd have to be blind. Uh, You'd have to be nuts. You'd have to be crazy. 
to dare to do something like that. Those are all synonyms for possessed. Uh, but some monk monkeyed with the text in an effort to legitimize the Roman Catholic doctrine of excommunication. That doctrine was where a church official had the power to declare to someone, do not pass go, do not collect $200, go straight to hell. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I, I thought I thought the names that are written in the Book of Life were written in indelible ink. So, obviously, take away his part out of the Book of Life, there's got to be something wrong there. Well, sure enough, <laughs> there's a textual variant, and all the scholars... G-L-T-T-R-A-W Griesbach, Lachman, Tischendorf, Tegelis, Alford, and Wordsworth that were in Barry's interlinear they all say that that word should not be book it should be tree tree, take away his part out of the tree of life that's really different isn't it? I mean, the, the word in Greek book is biblu and tree is xulu all right. I mean, they don't look alike, and they don't sound alike, except for the genitive case ending the oo. So it couldn't be a mistake that somebody misheard. It, I think somebody absolutely, deliberately changed the text. They had to be nuts to do that. Who would dare do such a thing, especially in that verse? Ah! Well, the same opinion, the same arrogance was used in other places. Ooh. I mean, but the word has to fit. And internal evidence trumps external evidence. Now, I actually have developed an additional internal evidence technique using signpost words. Now, if you followed my word study method, you know I talk about signpost words. Those are associated words that we find while doing word studies. And in 2005, I published my work in the word class, and I have one whole session on how to do word studies, and I show how I make a grid, like an Excel spreadsheet grid with columns and rows, and then I find the common terms, the associated signpost words that are in each paragraph associated or located near the word that I am studying, and I write them down as I go through and I find common terms that are clustered with the term that I am studying. Many times there's three or four, sometimes there's even more than that. And I did that with the word oikonomia, administration or stewardship. And we can actually use the same technique, the signpost methodology, to determine between some textual variants. So, go ahead and turn to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, chapter 1, in verse 3 and 4. Here it contains a textual variation. Some manuscripts read oikonomia, and others read oikodomia. The difference is an N or a D. So that, that sounds like an auditory error, all right? Which one is right? Oikonomia, administration, or oikodomia, edification? So, this presents a chance to use contextual inference by means of signpost words to find which of those textual variants, oikonomia versus oikodomia, is right. Now, the textual critics... You know, they used what was available to them, their external and internal evidence. And, like I said, Alford tried to champion internal evidence, saying that that variant must fit with the rest of the Bible. But, sometimes, the external evidence with the age of the text and what text family, etc., that came from, predominated over internal evidence. And that's what's happened in this 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. So 1 Timothy 1, 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Verse 4. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, 
which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. Now, if you look at Barry's interlinear for this, on this page, in verse 4, there's a note, G, in the apparatus that indicates, because in the, in the text it has oikonomion, which is accusative case for oikonomia, which is administration. It reads, rather than administration, which is in faith, all right? So anyway, the um, Stephen's text reads oikonomia, and it's very interesting that King James translated it edifying. They went with the other one, even though the Stephen's text said administration. But anyway, the Stephen's text has administration. Most of the textual critics say it should be that, administration, oikonomia. The Nestle text and the UBS text don't even show any variance at all for 1 Timothy 1.4. They don't think it's important enough. The Englishman's concordance in the back, uh, Tyndale's word study concordance, has a catalog of various readings where it has all the variations alphabetized in the back and it indicates that Beza which is right after Stevens supported oikodomia with a D edifying and some church fathers also church fathers publish their Sunday school quarterlies or their commentaries or their prayer books and they would quote scripture from their personal Bible, and sometimes their personal Bible that they had was older than anything else. They were the bishops, they were the scholars, so they had the best documents you could get. And so sometimes their readings that are included in their commentaries are older than anything that exists. So they support, many of them support oikodomia. Now, Tischendorf stated that the original version of Codex D read oikodomia, and then it was corrected to oikodomion. Uh, and then he lists several Latin manuscripts. Alford did say that Codex D read oikodomion, but then Alford went with oikonomion administration because of its stronger evidence. All right, so normally if I would be looking at all this information, I'd think about it and I'd probably side with the majority of the textual critics and the great unseals like the Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Alexandrinus and Codex Vaticanus. Those were entire Bibles from the 4th and 5th centuries. But the Elsevier critical text and the Beza critical text and Codex D are not very strong as a witness that says Oikodomia with the D. (laughs) Edifying. But If we apply what we've seen concerning associated words, signpost words, if you look at the signpost words for oikonomia, and I do this in my study in that session in the work and word class, the signpost words are are associated with oikonomia, with the N, administration. There's two patterns, because there's two meanings for oikonomia. First meaning for oikonomia is stewardship of a steward. And in that case, the signpost words are faithful or wise, or there's a ruler mentioned in a context who is accountable. So those are signposts for the meaning, number one, of oikonomia, which is a steward. But then, there is a second meaning for oikonomia, which is an administration, an era. Some people say this does not exist, but it absolutely does, because the contextual inference has a second pattern with different signpost words. Mystery, ages, and make known. All right? Well, are any of those associated terms in either pattern, faithful, wise, a ruler, mystery, ages, made known, do they show up in 1 Timothy 1, 3, and 4. 
We'll read it again. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies with minister questions, rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. None of those things are there. But, what if we look at the signpost words for oikodomia, edification? All right? Well, you'll see that they occur in contexts contrasting building with destruction. Romans 14.19 and Romans 15.2. It's edification versus destruction via stumbling blocks. 1 Corinthians 3.9. Edification versus defilement of the temple via erroneous teachings. 1 Corinthians 14, 3, 5, 12, and 26. Edification versus confusion. 2 Corinthians 10, 8, and 13, 10. Edification versus destruction. Ephesians 4, 12, and 16. You see a pattern here? Edification versus every wind of erroneous doctrine. Ephesians 4, 29. Edification versus corrupt communication. So, let's read 1 Timothy 1.3 again and see if those things are there. 1 Timothy 1.3 As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest teach some that they teach no other doctrine. Hmm. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying oikodomia, which is in faith. Now the end of the commandment is charity of a pure heart and of a good conscience of a faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of law, understanding neither what they say or whereof they affirm. So here you have edification versus no other doctrine, versus fables and endless genealogies, versus ministering questions versus vain jangling, foolish talk. So which pattern fits? Whoa! Oikodomia edification fits even though it's attestation in the manuscripts decided by external evidence is weaker than the other reading. That's fascinating. So, you can use signpost words to determine what textual variant really should be there based upon internal evidence. That's exciting. So, anyway, I I think that's neat. (laughs) In fact, it's incendiary. (laughs) I wrote Holger Struckwolf about this when I was trying to get a better picture of Erwin Nessel for my updated version of my work in the word syllabus. I have biographies of all the textual critics and things about their life and their methodology and their pictures. But I didn't have a very good picture of Erwin Nessel. So I wrote the Institute and along with my request, I sent him a copy of that entire chapter from my work in the word class. And then I told him about this. I got back not a peep, except a short comment about my chapter, but nothing about this signpost technique of internal evidence. Whoa. <laughs> well, maybe at the gathering together they'll tell them they ought to listen to the other nestle. <laughs> ah, whatever. Uh, where's my thunder button? Anyway, I'm going to get off my soapbox. So, the word has to fit. Jesus is God's only begotten Son. Okay? Back to John 1.18. I believe the internal evidence, this only begotten Son predominates over only begotten God for two reasons. First of all, the word only begotten is monogenos. It is a combination of mana only and genao to beget, to be the father of, to bear a son, to be born. It occurs nine times in the New Testament, six times of Jesus and three times of others. The Trinitarian interpreters claim that this word, monogenos, means 
the only one of its kind. Well, that's pretty sneaky to manufacture a definition that doesn't occur in other Greek literature, as Liddell and Scott Dictionary so shows. No, I think it means only begotten. Look how it's used in the Bible. Luke seventeen twelve. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man being carried out, the only son of his mother, only begotten, monogenos, not the only one of its kind of his mother. Eh. Luke eight forty two, For he had one only daughter, monogenos, about twelve years of age, and she lay a-dying, but as he went, the people thronged him. Then Luke nine thirty eight. And behold, a man of the company cried out, saying, Master, I beseech thee, look upon my son, for he is my monogenos, only child. So, it, only one of his kind does not fit. See? Now, the second reason I don't condone that reading of only begotten God is it violates both the immediate and the remote context. All right? The immediate context, because it's associated with the word father in both instances. In fact, even in the instances where monogenos is used of others, monogenos is always associated with a parent. And it's that way in the three times I read to you from Luke, the only son of his mother, the only of his daughter, his my only child, okay, so it's associated with a parent? Well, it's that way in all the other occurrences where the parent is God. John one fourteen, And the word was made flesh and dwelt with us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John one eighteen, No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. All the other occurrences associated with God in one way or another. So, I don't buy the only one of its kind meaning. They're trying to squirt out from underneath the truth of the word. It doesn't fit the pattern. It does not fit the internal evidence in the immediate context. But also, as, as I said, it doesn't fit the remote context. What's the remote context? John twenty thirty. And many other signs did Jesus truly in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. That's why the Gospel of John was written. And as we saw, incident after incident after incident were there. Why? To corroborate that. So, only begotten God does not corroborate that. Only begotten Son does. I rest my case. Um, next one, we cover John 5, where the Pharisees charged that Jesus made himself equal with God. Remember, Jesus used a, a one point of dissimilarity proof for that. All right. So the next one is John 10.30, I and my Father are one. Boy, they go ballistic and froth in the mouth about that one. But I say, whoa, now, hold on there. Read the context. Jesus did address this further because the Pharisees misinterpreted that I and the Father are one the same way that the Trinitarians do. See, but before I go there, I want, to, I want to bring up another verse that uses the same language. Look at John seventeen nine. John seventeen nine, Jesus said, "I pray for them." He's praying for us. I pray not for the world, but for them which Thou hast given me, for they are Thine, and all mine are Thine, and Thine are mine, and I'm glorified in them. Verse eleven. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to Thee, Holy Father. Keep through Thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. So, if John 10.30, I and the Father are one, makes Jesus God, then by the same logic, we're God too. I can't mean that. It's got to mean something different than what they conclude. Look at John 10 and read the rest of the context. John 10, verse 30, I and my Father are one. 
Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them and said, Many good works have I shown you from my Father, for which of these works do you stone me? The Jews answered them, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou, being a man, makes thyself God. Well, that's what the Trinitarians say too, right? Well, what did Jesus say? Did he say, right on, brother, you're right, I'm God. No, he didn't. Jesus corrected them, and he did it by quoting them the word. All right? John ten thirty four. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are gods. Verse 35. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture can't be broken, say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, you blaspheme, because I said I am God. No, he didn't say that. Because I said I am the Son of God. So what did Jesus imply when he said, I and the Father are one, in verse 30. Did he imply that he was God? Did he? Did he? Absolutely not. Jesus declared in verse 36 what he was implying. That he was the Son of God. Also, what was that scripture that he quoted? You know, you remember, when it, whenever he quotes, whenever we, there's a quotation... It's quoted there for a reason, right? Well, what's the reason? Well, you have to go back and read the quotation. Then you import the the connotation, the meaning, the application of that quotation, that idea. You import that into the New Testament where it's quoted. Because that's why they quoted it. All right? So, Psalm 82 is where this comes from. Psalm 82, verse 1. God... Elohim, stands in the congregation of the mighty. El. He judged among he judges among the gods. Elohim. Well, which gods are those? The next verse says so. Psalm 82, verse 2. How long will you gods judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Salah. Well, which gods are that? Verse 3, defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. So who were these Elohim? They were human judges. You see, in that culture, they didn't call judges your honor. They called them Elohim. That's just what they did. So, he judges among the gods, verse 1. Which gods? The Elohim, the judges. Alright? In fact, in Exodus 22, it says, in verse 28, Thou shalt not revile the gods. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> All the plagues were judgments against the gods of Egypt. And then he says, Thou shalt not revile them? No. No nor curse the ruler of thy people, it goes on to say. These Elohim were the judges in Exodus 22, 28. Thou shalt not revile the judges. Okay? And I'll throw you in a brig for contempt of court. See. So, what was Jesus doing when he quoted Psalm 82 to those Pharisees? (laughs) He actually was slapping them. (laughs) They were acting like the judges, judging the people promoting legalism, etc. And Jesus was saying they were like those corrupt Elohim judges in Psalm 82 that God's going to judge. Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo. That's why he quoted it. Alright? So, anybody want to use this to prove Trinity anymore? <laughs> okay, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here. But if this teaching ever gets out and it's heard by one of the opposition, you know, some may say of me, oh, you're being too sanctimonious, too forceful with your proof. Well, to that I say, uh, what, and you Trinitarians are not? (laughs) Can I I reply to their scorn and intimidation that they use a lot of with a bit of force my own? (laughs) Can I stand up for those who've been scorned and intimidated and persecuted and worse over the centuries? And don't get me started. But, um, 
Uh, they just don't like it when they're proven wrong. <laughs> but this is a proper forum here in this teaching for getting the truth out and informing folks like you so you have a reply if you're ever confronted. But now I'm absolutely not march, uh, advocating marching into their meetings and disrupting them, all right? I'm not promoting burning down their buildings, all right? I don't want a millstone hung around my neck, and neither do you. So, here's something else they use. John 20. We're going to end up here before the break, all right? I think I'm getting a little long-winded. <laughs> Bless your heart. Uh, John 20, verse 24. John 20. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Dynamis, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples came to him and said, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Except I shall see his hands, the priest, uh, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Woo. After eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus. Woo. The doors being shut, stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. And then he said, Thomas... Thomas, reach hither thy finger, behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. So they they point to that and say, See, see, Jesus is God. Well, (laughs) to understand this, I think, we just simply have to put ourselves in Thomas's situation. I mean, how embarrassed, uh, how penitent, uh, how guilty would you feel? Thomas said, I won't believe, except I see in his hand the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand away aside. I won't believe. Well, I mean, he was supposed to be an apostle. Well, Jesus had to confront that and he did. And he made it a turning point in Thomas's life, just like he had done for Peter. You know, so eight days later, <laughs> Scotty beams Jesus down right into the midst of the twelve. <laughs> and Jesus singled out Thomas. Come here, Thomas. Well, uh, how would you express yourself if you were he? <laughs> as emphatically as you could, right? I mean... <laughs> that kind of speech enters the figurative category. You know, <laughs> we all have ways to express sincere apology when I'm sorry won't do. Uh, have you ever been in situations like that? Yes. <laughs> well, Thomas used one of the figurative ways that they would in their culture to do that. My Lord and my God. That is in the form of the figure of speech, Hendia days. Two for one. You know what? Thomas was probably there when Jesus said correct the Pharisees for calling him God in John 10. If not, Thomas would have certainly heard of it. So, I mean, he's already on pretty thin ice here. Do you think that he would compound the error by making another grave mistake and calling Jesus God? I trow not. (laughs) No way. So there has to be something else here than what some may think. There has to be some other meeting. After all, Jesus didn't commend him for his insight like he did with Peter. When Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of God, remember? Jesus said, flesh and blood have not reveal that to you, right? Remember? Well, he didn't say anything like that to Thomas. So, I don't think Thomas was trying to impress Jesus with his spirituality, uh, declaring some new insight heretofore unsaid. Does that make sense? So I, I don't think the Trinitarian angle makes sense in this context. A handiades is the figure where two things are stated, but one thing is meant. Shakespeare has a very famous one. The best laid plans of mice and men. Mice and men. Two things stated, one thing meant. Men who are like mice. Micely men. Men who are weak as mice. Now, the Bible has many of these. You can, you can look at Bullinger's examples. Alright? So, when Thomas used a handiades to emphatically answer Jesus, he literally exclaimed, My godly Lord. I mean, that's how we would render that figure literally. Now, we don't talk like that today. We don't use Shakespearean English or 
Pandia days. So I can see why it would be misunderstood. In fact, since Jesus had been recently raised from among the dead, and there he stood in his resurrected body, I could even accept the meaning of my God-like Lord. Because you know what? In Hebrews 1.8, it does call Jesus God. Yep, it does say that. But you got to read the next verse. You know, don't stop like some of our friends do. Read the next verse. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, he's saying to the Son, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Well, don't stop there. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Well, is Jesus a God? Well, technically, since he redeemed us and the world and is the second Adam and has the dominion back, well, I mean, that's why the name of Jesus Christ works, right? We're exercising his dominion in his absence by the power of attorney. That's why the name works. So technically, legally, Jesus is the God of this world. I mean, do you use the name of Jesus in prayer? I mean, that's what you're declaring. You're utilizing his name of power of attorney. And what what power are you using? The dominion. He legally is the God of this world. He just has not evicted the previous tenant yet. (laughs) Furthermore, Jesus in his resurrected form is going to be a judge. Well, what are they called judges back then? Elohim. So, put yourself in Thomas Sandals. Talk like he would talk. But, is Jesus God with a capital G? No. Hebrews 1.9 proves that. Therefore, God, even thy God. Well, how can God have a God? <laughs> I mean, is it like that limerick? <laughs> Every flea has another flea on his back to bite him. And on and on infinitum. <laughs> you remember that? One more thing. We don't want to be one verse Charlie's, right? What do all the other verses in the subject say? So, <laughs> I mean, I think it's pretty clear that every verse in the Gospel of John that they have affirmed that says Jesus is God doesn't. And the Gospel of John is written that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So, let's take a break. Bless you.